Welcome to People of Purpose. People of Purpose. People of Purpose. People of Purpose. People of Purpose is a podcast of inspiring people whose stories help you see things differently, live with intentionality, elevate the way you participate in the world, and take the necessary leaps in your life to seek and find your passions. Come with us and develop the courage to wholeheartedly pursue your purpose and unleash your truest potential. And I'm driving there and there was like something, I don't know, I was like just observing my breath, my body, it was like something happened where I just like this joy came out of me that was so huge. I got to the Burger King and like, it was like my smile was like tearing my face off, like I was smiling so huge. <laughs> I walked in the Burger King and like people like stopped to look at me like what's with this guy? There was even a guy who came out from the fry deck to look at this guy like what is his, what's he on? And then I was like not on anything. I was on life. I was on my breathing. I was on yoga. I went to business school. I got three degrees in, in five years and I knew from day one that I would never join corporate America. I would never join the rat race. I never felt like those people in that school were, were my people. I always felt like an outsider and I was proud to be that way. I don't think that a rat race is, is healthy for, for anyone, but I think a lot of people, you know, go into an atmosphere like that and get kind of swept up in this competitive, like almost fear-based culture where they pigeon themselves or box themselves into this way of living that it's like you're behind a desk all the time and your, your days start running together in a way that that you kind of lose yourself and I don't think people understand like what that sacrifice actually really does to them over time. We want to give people the freedom, we want to give people the strength to know that no matter what comes into their life, the good, the bad, the ugly, no matter what comes in, they have a tool, they have an inner resilience and they've got a technique to access that resilience that can help them work with these difficulties and that's beautiful. That's a beautiful transformation of spirit. I always felt isolated. I always felt like I didn't quite belong. I got bullied a lot growing up. I struggled with depression and anxiety. And I remember the first time that I really felt like I loved myself was when I was on my own mat. Over time, as you keep the equanimity of the mind, the balance of the mind, there's this profound clarity that comes, a freedom that comes, and you just feel like there's nothing in the way. I guess it's like a science of getting out of your own way. You plug away for something that's bigger than yourself, something that's bigger than the, the material things that come along with being like an executive here, or a, like a president there. And you, I think you end up serving yourself much more when, when that bigger purpose isn't lost on you, when it's not just about the, the money and competitive nature of it that you feel more connected to the universe that way. You feel this unconditional happiness or this unconditional self-love that doesn't require someone else to agree with you or even like you to feel it. You can be like, oh, wait, this person has a different way of living, they have a different way of being, and they, they maybe don't even care for me, but we can still have a rational discourse. We can still either work in our own separate ways or figure out a way to work together if we have to. And it's, and it's like you, you put less burden on others because you have so much coming from within. I remember after the first time that I sat my, my 10 day course, on the way out of it, I stopped to grab a drink when I was driving home and just on the street, I had this stranger come up to me and be like, you're radiant, like your eyes are so bright, like your smile is so big and like I just wanted to tell you, I don't know why, but you're radiant. And I just remember feeling like, yeah, I am, like hell yeah, I am. I felt like a million dollars leaving that meditation course. Highly effective people are great leaders seek first to understand and then to be understood. You know, you don't have to be some kind of world leader or some sort of, you know, spiritual healer in order to empathically understand what people in Syria are going through mm -hmm. at a time like this, that, you know, there's a way to, to kind of listen to what's going on in the world with, with your whole being to find a way to reclaim the spark that, we're, that we all, for the most part, have felt at some point or the other. 
That's our number one duty is to not let life bury that. To not, to not forget our heart. My guests today are a pair of wonderful people, Jason Holshoff and Drew DiBiase, who find their purpose in teaching yoga. Together they run Heart Yoga in Uptown Minneapolis. Heart Yoga is not a yoga studio, it is a yoga school, a frontier where anyone and everyone can heal and grow. Yoga found Jason in a crazy summer of 1995, self-taught until 2000 when he met his teacher Johnny Kest and after working closely with Johnny to share flowing yoga for 15 years, he started Heart Yoga in Minneapolis, Minnesota. His current mission is to share Heart Yoga and its core philosophies with the world. Drew DiBiase was forced to take her first yoga class in 2004 and says she hated every second of it. After having a deep calling to try it again the following year, it led her to teacher training with Jason Holshoff and Johnny Kest in 2011. Considered an anomaly by her peers, Drew is both a healer of the soul and a business maven. Her current mission is also to share heart yoga with the world. You can visit heartyogaonline.com for more information on upcoming teacher training opportunities or inquiries to hire Jason and Drew for trainings, events, and workshops. Jason and Drew are wonderful teachers, but as I discovered over my summer in Minneapolis, they're even higher quality people. I was introduced to them through the magical social marketing platform, Groupon. I took my first class and was blown away with the quality of yoga and the infectious energy in their cozy 880 square foot studio. Yoga has become a core part of who I am. It came into my life six years ago at a time where my body, mind, and spirit were quite broken. It has been the cornerstone of my rehabilitative process and consistently guides me towards a greater and greater potential. I think few things are better than the feeling you get sharing such an intentional space with others who are working so hard to each develop their own inner consciousness and unveil a greater and truer purpose. This interview really resonates with me because I think the three of us really share a lot of the same missions. Yoga makes me feel so alive in the truest part of myself. It makes me live with a greater faith, more intuitively, and I make heart-guided decisions that are in line with my truest nature. In this process, I feel put in places and positions off the mat where I use this inner wisdom and strength to empower myself and others. As a yoga teacher myself, trained in India, I feel competent on the core philosophies at the heart of yoga and meditation. It was so cool for me to stay after most of my classes at Heart Yoga this summer, discussing some of the deeper elements of yoga. I also recorded a rare testimony, fresh out of my final class with Drew and Jason, just moments after I had arrived at the apartment where I was staying. I'm a bit out of breath in the recording, but I am alive and well. I felt such a profound and raw, positive emotions that I decided I should just share the footage with you. When you finish listening, I think you should read a blog entry I wrote a year and a half ago when I first found spiritual intentionality from yoga at my week-long island yoga retreat in Koh Noi, Thailand. The link to my blog post from the studentoftheworld.wordpress.com is in the show notes. I absolutely love yoga, and I think Drew and Jason explained the value of yoga with the best I've ever heard. On one of my last days this past summer in Minneapolis, we got together in their studio for a sunny, late morning conversation that really brought our conversations full circle and made me appreciate them so much more as people. I have to warn you that we start the interview with a guide to meditation. Please, if you are driving, do not fully participate in the meditation. You can certainly follow along and observe your breath, but definitely keep your eyes open and your attention on where it needs to be to ensure your present safety. If you're in a safe space, do give it your best go. I think doing so will allow you to listen to this conversation quite intentionally. And if you do, I promise the next hour will be wonderful and quite fruitful. Please enjoy my interview with the purposeful, passionate personalities of Drew DiBiase and Jason Holshoff. I absolutely love Drew and Jason's classes. They're phenomenal. The way I feel after I step out of there is unmatched. Today, my last class in Uptown at their studio here in Heart Yoga, I had to stop and take a selfie because I felt more joyful, more happy, more radiant, more transformed than I have felt in a long, long time. I feel as if I'm entering a new stage of my life, beginning this podcast. 
and they have been right there for every step of this journey I've been going through here the last two months here in Minneapolis. The words are so powerful. The feelings are so intense. I don't love every minute of class at all. In fact, many moments I am struggling to sit and be patient in a spot of pain and suffering. They call it playing the edge. It's a crazy game to play, but it's so true that when you sit in the edge and you breathe, that's where the true transformation and healing comes. I'm so thankful that I've gotten to know Drew and Jason on a personal level. And here is my interview with the two of them sitting in their studio on one of my last afternoons in Minneapolis in the summer of 2017. So I'm Jason Holshoff, the founder of Heart Yoga, sitting here with Tanner and Drew DiBiase. And Tanner, what's your last name? Badgley. <laughs> Badgley. <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, Tanner asked us to start with a short meditation. It's always helpful to turn your attention inward for meditation, so close the eyes. And there are so many different meditation techniques. They all involve an object of meditation, or many of them involve an object of meditation. In the tradition behind heart yoga, we use the natural rhythm of your breathing, which is different than trying to control your breath like a deep breath. You just watch your breathing as it is. You may notice it has a fast rhythm, a slow rhythm, a circular rhythm or an erratic rhythm. Your task is not to choose what particular kind of breath that you create, but simply observe what is. If you can do this for even a minute or two, it's like a brake pedal. The wheels of the mind turn a little slower. and your consciousness expands. So take another minute and simply observe the natural rhythm of your breathing. Good. Good job. You can open your eyes now. It's a nice beginning to our interview, Tanner. Yeah. It's already more spacious in here. I love opening my eyes to your massive smile. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So yeah, I'm, I'm with uh, Drew and Jason at Heart Yoga. We're in uptown Minneapolis. So what is this what is this thing you guys have, this project, this studio, this lifestyle that you created for yourself? What's Heart Yoga? Heart Yoga is really born from the desire to create a, a, a yoga studio or create a place where, where people who really see yoga as a chance to transform themselves and see yoga as a chance to grow on every level have an opportunity to do just that. And people who are unfamiliar with yoga can come to a kind of yoga where they really feel an opportunity to grow on in every way. Why it's even called heart yoga is heart is a word that can mean many things. But one of the key ideas why that it came to my mind very clearly, um, I was contemplating, I used to work for Lifetime Fitness, a big corporation, help um, run their teacher training on a national level. And there was one morning where I had taught a yoga class and I was considering starting a uh, yoga studio for quite some time and kicking around a lot of different names, which is not that easy anymore because there's so many yoga studios and pretty much all the cool names are taken. And I was like, well, what can we call it? And I was thinking this and this. And there's at least a hundred permutations of the name that went through it. Um, after a particular class teaching and seeing the experience of the students, it just became so clear that 
what yoga means to us here um, to the community that I want to create it's really a place where a, a student or a, a practitioner can pour their heart into their own experience because when you do do that then you just get so much back when you put your whole being into what you're doing on your yoga mat there's just like a untold um, uh, well of benefits and um, gifts that you get that come from within and so it's, uh, we've created a place here where People can get introduced to yoga or go deeper in their practice and really go on this amazing journey of, of self-exploration and, and self-understanding and um, to do it passionately with heart. So that's a little bit about heart yoga. Maybe I'll turn over to Drew. Drew is uh, my right-hand woman here. She's the, I don't, I don't have a hard time with titles, but I call her the president. She kind of helps me do everything at heart yoga. And Drew, why, why did you come here? What, what have you found at heart yoga? What do you see in this community? What have you tried to add to it? I see a lot of purpose in the community. There's a very eclectic group uh, from all vocations, all different backgrounds just here. But there is that common thread that Jason talked about, that people are looking for a deeper experience than just learning the postures. Anybody can learn a warrior too. I, I bend my knee here. I stretch my arms there. And, and that, there's the pose. I did it. But... We really want to use breath and movement, meditation, all of these different tools and techniques as a way to go deeper, to find deeper meaning. And so what I've tried to add to that is obviously just um, that spirit, because there's something about being within the walls of this studio that's quite small. I forget how, under 900 square feet. 880. Yeah. Coming in at a, a big 80 here. Um, but within these walls, there's just, there's so much energy and love. And I I try to facilitate more and more of it. So. Yeah. So what is, a, as a yoga teacher, what kind of practice are you trying to paint? Like, what is a beautiful yoga practice to you? What do you start to? Well, I think... A beautiful practice for me personally is when I have an opportunity to process what is going on in my mind and in my body in that moment. There's a class in particular that um, really stood out to me last summer that Jason taught, and I was going through a a difficult time with um, some personal things, and it brought me to tears. I was working so hard that, and working through so much that it just... It like brought me to my knees, not just physically, but like mentally, emotionally, spiritually, that like every boundary and wall that I had up came crashing down. And I think uh, one thing that the yoga community on a whole misses is that opportunity to go there, to like go to the most vulnerable places and, and see what's actually there. Yeah. That's sound like a beautiful practice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can you remember when you just felt like you just completed a beautiful practice or you just led someone through a beautiful practice? You know, one thing I, I see quite frequently in classes, Tanner, is that, and, and this is like, it's really neat to see. I've had the, the gift of teaching yoga for almost 20 years. I think I'm on 18 years now or 19 years or something. And I've never seen it once where if a student got their mind completely in their body or did the best they could, you know, they got out of their head and they were really feeling each breath and each moment that there wasn't some inner beauty that awakened. To me, I feel most successful as a teacher and I feel like there was something beautiful that happened when students do process what they need to process. You know, we all have these wheels that keep turning in our heads. And when, when you can, you can just feel it in the room when, when the students to some degree or another dip beneath the surface of their thoughts and they get into the rhythm of their body and the rhythm of their breathing, and they, they can kind of transcend the thinking brain and the, the, the boxes that they put themselves in or, or put their experience in, the room feels freer. The room f- feels like there's this, like each student kind of radiates a, I mean, this sounds like really mystical or, or esoteric, but it, it really feels like this, like almost like a student brings a light to the room. And they can be an older student, a younger student, a student who would look on a superficial level, aesthetically pleasing in the posture, or a student who who wobbles and falls all over the place. 
there's a, a beauty or, or for a lack of a better word, a grace that comes to them when they're moving with their breath and their body. I can remember one woman who actually had been told by several yoga teachers, she didn't think yoga was for them because when she'd come to class, she had a lot of limitations, a lot of pain, and she'd look quite odd in the postures or have to modify everything. And teachers would either want to fix her and put a bunch of like rules on how she should be doing it or even tell her that it's not appropriate class for her. And, you know, our methodology is, has a lot of faith in the human body and its resiliency. So we don't put people in those, those kind of um, those limitations. We don't put those limitations. And she moved through and she worked with her own pain and her own strain and was breathing in every pose. She looked goofy as heck, quote unquote, or, or odd or different. But she had a beautiful practice because at the end she goes, my back has never felt this good after five years. And that, that's just, just not just one person. That happens time and time again. Right. When, when people start to, this is something my teacher taught me, his name, a man named Johnny Kest. My teacher always says this again and again is that we're not using our bodies to get into poses. We're using the poses to get into our bodies. And what that means, Tanner, is that we're using the postures as different lenses, different angles by which you can look at your physical experience. And when anybody does that, regardless of whether they can do the postures gracefully or, or athletically or dance-like or whether they're following all over the place, when anybody uses the pose as a tool to feel their body, as a tool to link mind and body, as a tool to take their consciousness inward, they look beautiful. And they have a beautiful practice. Yeah. There's a grace about them. And, and you can just feel the transformation that's going on. And it's, it's such a... There's something else that's, to just kind of riff on this word beautiful about that. What's beautiful for me as a teacher, it's like this sense that like every time that I help somebody do that, some positive thing happens for them. Like just in the class, I taught a class at 9.30 right before this interview. There was a woman, she does yoga a few times a year, she said. And she came and it was a very hard class and she had her difficulties. It didn't look, she didn't look like, I mean, she was sweating and she didn't look pretty or whatever. But she was beautiful because the insight she came to was so powerful. She's like, I realize that every time I get stressed out, my job is so stressful. Tears would rise. My job is so stressful. I realize I hold my breath all the time. And I felt here, even though it was so hard, I could breathe. And I, you could just feel this freedom that came about in her, this insight that, yes, I'm bigger than my pain. I'm bigger than my difficulties. And you know, and you know as a teacher that you share that with somebody, that's a beautiful experience. And this is, goes back to like what we're trying to do at Heart Yoga. We want to give people the freedom. We want to give people the strength to know that no matter what comes into their life, the good, the bad, the ugly, no matter what comes in, they have a tool, they have an inner resilience, and they've got a technique to access that resilience that can help them um, um, work with these difficulties. And that's beautiful. That's a beautiful transmission of spirit. Wow. Yes. What do you, Drew, what do you see your role as a teacher um, in, the, in, a, in another individual's practice? What is your role? If you're not telling them how things should necessarily be done, what is your role to guide their practice? Well, I think it's important to help people understand where they're coming from. You know, it's easy to, you know, be swept up in fighting against something and hating something and in this kind of negative way. Mm -hmm. And I feel it's really important for me as a teacher to help people fight for something like their own inner peace, their own inner state yeah. and having control over their, you know, their own breath and body in that kind of way to where it doesn't have to feel so, um, isolating, you know, you might join some kind of revolution or another, but it's, yeah. it really can be kind of empty in that way. If, if it's coming from a place of hate and, I can facilitate even just a tiny bit coming from a place more of love and acceptance and goodwill, then it does a whole lot of good, not just for the individual, but those vibrations immediately start to move to others. That yeah. I think people underestimate how much of our communication is done in our energy, just in those vibrational exchanges. You mentioned before that you think this is a place of a lot of purpose involved. What do you see as your purpose um, and the attention you're bringing into a class that you teach? Well, I think more and more um, I'm finding 
a big role in teaching teachers. We lead teacher trainings here, Jason and myself, and I, I see more and more of a role for myself there because I think, like I mentioned, the yoga community on a whole is, I think, missing some of this grander purpose. And, you know, we don't, we like to say that we don't train yoga instructors, people that can get you in and out of the postures and, you know, from A to B, but we like, we train yoga teachers. We want to train people to convey this message of yoga and convey this deeper meaning and get people to go on these inner journeys because that journey is the one that's infinite. It'll never stop. So where did your guys' inner journeys in yoga begin? Jason, Jason why don't I know you, you said start? 19 years ago you started teaching. Can you take us a little bit before that? Yeah, what, I started doing yoga somewhere around age 20, and it was a period of utter chaos and darkness in my life. Like a lot of people, when they go off to college, they make some bad decision how much they <laughs> use this or that substance and how much they alter the mind with those substances. And you know, I grew up in South Dakota, graduated high school in 1993. And yoga on the whole, I think around that time in the country, there's maybe a, a smattering of yoga studios as, as a whole in the country in 1993. And people sure as hell didn't do yoga in South Dakota. People ate meat. And, and uh, you, know, like, you know, like, it was just not a yoga culture. I, I have vague memories. I don't know if I'm projecting this on my past or, or not, but I have vague memories of being really little, like a kindergarten and watching public television. And there was a woman named Lilius Fulman who used to have yoga. Like, you can Google Lilius. And um, I have vague memories of seeing those on public television when I was a kid, but yoga was just completely off the radar. Like, I, I mean, I don't know, like, how I even I stop. They say that yoga finds you, as opposed to you finding yoga, and I totally believe it in my case. Like, South Dakota, nobody did yoga. It wasn't a big deal. It was off the radar. I was an athlete. I was a wrestler and a football player. And, you know, it's just a completely kind of different world from the yoga world. And then, you know, went off to college and, and kind of went into a, a, a spiral. But in hindsight, really, I was looking for something. And when I would drink to extremes or smoke to extremes or take this or that substance to, to ameliorate whatever pain I was in, back in hindsight, I was always the one taking way too much and doing one just like just out of the pale. And in hindsight, I was, I was searching. And that was the one, one vehicle that seemed like the way, a way out or a way to see a bigger reality. And, um, and so eventually it actually came, I had taken a number of substances and, and I find myself doing these weird stretches and like breathing and kind of moving. And then when I sobered up, I was like, you know, maybe it wasn't the next day, but within a week or two or a, a period around there, I was like, you know, I want to teach myself yoga. I want to learn yoga. I started to buy books and, and learn from that. And you learned from books. You weren't coming to classes. No, no. I was self-taught. There's a little book called Richard Hillman's 28 Day Yoga Plan. And it was a really neat little book um, because you had to do 28 days of yoga. And if you ever missed a day, you had to start over at the beginning. And, it, and when I, I bought the book and it took me several months to actually make it 28 days straight because I kept going to a certain point and failing, going to a certain point and failing. And over the course of that period of time, there's a huge physical transformation. I lost 50 or 60 pounds. There was a profound transformation in terms of, of my relationship with substance. I stopped drinking, stopped smoking weed, stopped doing other stuff, all that other stuff. Cleaned up some legal troubles I found myself in. I was just like a radical transformation. Repaired certain relationships that had gone awry because of all that. And it just like, you know... That was the point. I believe one of the questions you had to prepare for the interview is like, how did you know yoga was going to be a big part of your life? And that, that was it. There was something from that little book and doing it. This took about half an hour a day where my life radically changed, where my, my sense of trajectory and, and um, what, what to look for for solutions. You know, one of the things about people who observe substances is that they're looking for solutions to different pains and difficulties, but they're looking in the wrong places. Like that old country music song, I don't know if you've ever heard it before, looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> and you're like looking, you're searching for, for something where you feel at home, where you feel peace, where you feel this bigger reality in all the wrong places. And that, I went through a period like that in my life, two or three years, very dark. And luckily, yoga, once I found it, it's like that stuff all dropped away. And like certain doors in my mind opened profoundly. So, you know, just crazy, profound experiences. And, and um, I knew that yoga would always be a part of my life after that. What is a certain door of profound experience? I had this crazy job where 
it would be during the football playoffs or NBA playoffs, you'd go and I worked for a t-shirt company that would set up like little shops selling t-shirts. Like it was in, the one was in West Virginia and it was selling Pittsburgh Steelers t-shirts when they had made it to the Super Bowl. Yeah. And there was a time I was driving to a Burger King to pick up a friend of mine's uh, Whopper and some French fries for him. And I was doing my yoga practice and I was also fasting at the time. It was just kind of this cleansing process that was very spontaneous. That wasn't like a, not that disciplined when it comes to eating. It was just kind of a spontaneous thing. And I was driving to get his Whopper with cheese. And I'm driving there and there was like something, I don't know, I was like just observing my breath, my body. It was like something happened where I just like this joy came out of me that was so huge. I got to the Burger King and like, it was like my smile was like tearing my face off. Like I was smiling so huge. <laughs> I walked in the Burger King and like people like stopped to look at me like, what's with this guy? There was even a guy who came out from the fry deck to look at this guy. Like, what is he, what is he on? And it, I was like not on anything. I was on life. I was on my breathing. I was on yoga. And so there's just these moments of like transcendent joy and freedom that came from me doing a little book. And I was like, that was like, I knew that there's something in this for me. This is kind of actually a little bit, I don't tell that story to too many people because it's kind of weird. But <laughs> um, so, so you got it on. It's, it's safe for posterity now. It's on the Long internet. Way. It's going to be on the internet. So anyways, but yeah, that, that was like, that's one of the <laughs> weird experiences that led me down this rabbit hole. Thank you. <laughs> uh, do you have any competing weirdness? Oh, gosh. Out? I uh, took my first yoga class when I was a senior in high school. I went with a couple of girlfriends that wanted to go, and I hated it. I hated it every second. I, I felt uncomfortable from the start. It was a cold room. I didn't care for the woman teaching it. Um, I just, it felt very superficial to me, and it just, I felt like I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. It just, nothing connected for me. So I'm like, well, I know yoga isn't isn't for me. But then, um, you know, a couple months later I graduated and then came up here to Minnesota for school at the U and I found myself going to lifetime fitness and I stumbled into a hot yoga class, a vinyasa where I was flowing more and, and I, it kind of like lit me up a little bit where it was like, I felt my body in such a different way and I got a good sweat. And I remember being in Shavasana on the final rest and it felt so good to just be still and quiet and to just observe. And that's when I kind of knew that there was something to explore. And then more and more, it was like, I was going one, two times a day. I was, you know, reading books about it. I was, um, you know, I went and studied abroad in India and it just more and more of it started to click. And my entire life, I always felt isolated. I always felt like I didn't quite belong. I got bullied a lot. Growing up, I struggled with depression and anxiety. And I remember the first time that I really felt like I loved myself was when I was on my yoga mat. It was the first time I ever felt like, like this is right. And, you know, for a lot of people, I think when you try to convey that to others, you know, and they're just like, why are you so obsessed about this? Like this yoga, you do it all the time. Like you don't do anything else. Like, is it a problem? You know, and they think of it like it's, like it's <laughs> some addiction. burden. Yeah. Like this. Yeah. I mean, and it kind of is in a way, cause you get addicted to that feeling of like loving yourself and feeling like, like you can tackle anything if, if you're coming from the right place and have the right mindset. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I just didn't care what people said cause it just felt right. Like your intuition takes over and you start to understand that, that you're all, you're, always going to be your own best teacher and I just remember from there it just kind of unfolded in a way where it was like more and more I was taking yoga class and late to my school classes but the collective of it actually made my grades improve because it was you know I was just becoming more efficient with my time I was you know making better life choices I you know was getting better sleep I was more focused and then I started adding in this meditation part as I was going through teacher training with Jason and Johnny Kest and, um, and not too long after that, when I was teaching, I sat my first 10 day meditation course of the Vipassana technique. Jason and I both are kind of veterans of doing that. But I remember after the first time that I sat my, my 10 day course, 
on the way out of it, I stopped to grab a drink when I was driving home and just on the street, I had this stranger come up to me and be like, you're radiant. Like your eyes are so bright. Like your smile is so big. And like, what are, like, I just wanted to tell you, I don't know why, but you're radiant. And I just remember feeling like, yeah, I am like, hell yeah, I am. I felt like a million dollars leaving, leaving that meditation course. And it kind of just feels like, a, I don't know, like such a, a win, not just for me, but for everyone. Cause I know that, that, that kind of energy is infectious. It, it obviously touched a, a stranger on the street. So sky's the limit. I think when it comes to to yoga and meditation, whether it's at a Burger King or a meditation course, you can have transcending moments. Yeah, that's crazy. Anyway. We've all done Vipassana. I've, I've done five days only. You guys seem to be way ahead on what you've done, but yeah, like, <laughs> what what does Vipassana make you feel like? How does that change your mind? Well, I, 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 for me, when I go to the course, I mean, there's a lot of ways to describe it, but it just feels like a profound cleanse. You know, people do fasts of different sorts and you just feel the, the, you know, the spiritual tradition after spiritual tradition, mystic after mystic says that at the base, our mind is this radiant purity. And there's something about serious meditation work, especially where you go into silence and you observe yourself and there's different techniques for that, but um, kind of a possible that um, Drew and I are involved in as observing your breathing, observing your bodily sensations. You do that for hour after hour in silence. And there's over time, as you keep the equanimity of the mind, the balance of the mind, there's this profound clarity that comes, a, a freedom that comes. And you just feel like there's nothing in the way. I guess it's like a science of getting out of your own way. There's a like a Nelson Mandela quote, or I don't know if he actually said it, you know, these internet quotes, you can't always trust them, but something like our greatest fear is not our limitations, but our, our inner greatness or the infinity within or something like that. Or, mm-hmm. And... You know, like you have this chance to just feel like, wow, there, there is something sweet inside. There's something beautiful inside. There's something free inside me that, that does not have to be burdened by the, the burdens that I pick up so easily. And so it's kind of like you go away on those meditation retreats and it's like, it's like a deep cleanse and as opposed to just like a vacation, which can give you some fun or relax you a little bit. And sometimes you feel cleansed from vacation, but there's something about meditation because it doesn't feel like a vacation. It feels like hard work every moment. Yeah. And then you're yeah. done, but you're done. And it's like, wow, I just purified. And sometimes you don't even realize until you get back into the world and back into your normal routine. It's like, wow, I am lighter. I am freer. Yeah. And that freedom is kind of speaking back to what Drew was saying after her meditation course, that freedom is what this world needs. I, you know, one of the questions you ask is how does yoga or how does heart yoga fit into like the current climate? And it just seems like there's so much fragmentation. You know, you look in the political discourse or it's always like two sides getting to each other. And, and actually I've heard studies of sociology that you think that the internet and social media would make us more open to a broader thing of ideas. But what they're actually finding is because of how the algorithms like a Facebook and what have you work, you're actually more and more exposed to only the ideas that they can tell, like, like the different comments. And it's like the ideas that are in car- accord Social with your, is what I'm yeah, yeah. Like you get boxed in it. Like, let's say you're left of center. You get boxed in with left. You're right. You get boxed in with right. And it's like, you're, we're actually getting exposed to fewer alternative viewpoints than we just when we relate to each other without our phones or without the internet. And so like, that's one of the great things is that's the neat thing about meditation, that clamp, that freedom inside is you feel this unconditional happiness or this unconditional self love that doesn't require someone else to agree with you or even like you to feel it. You can be like, oh, this person has a different way of living. They have a different way of being and they, they maybe don't even care for me, but we can still have a rational discourse. We can still either work in our own separate ways or figure out a way to work together if we have to. And it's, and it's like you, you put less burden on others because you have so much coming from within. It's like you have these inner resources that you put less and less strain on others. And that's one of the great benefits of be it deep meditation or deep yoga practice or any serious self work work. We don't, even though we, you know, we feel like we have something unique and beautiful here. There's, you know, there's people who have transcended their, their inner limitations in all kinds of different ways. Any serious self work, it leads to the sense of a more self worth, more inner light so that you put less and less burden on others. And then all your other relationships function with more harmony. Mm-hmm. And then like, like the great leaders like Martin Luther King or Gandhi or what have you, 
you know, they all say, like, stand for the truth, but do it with non-violence in your heart, with non-hatred in your heart. And, like, yoga is a chance to, meditation is a chance to do that inner work so that more and more in our little everyday, you know, you don't have to be, you know, on that kind of scale. We all have politics going on in our life. We all have ups and downs and power struggles and little dramas and this or that person angling and all that. And we can go about it in better and better ways the more our own inner light shines. So you still do engage in worldly issues and require some sort of opinion or argumentation? Or what is your relationship to those as a yogi? We all have to participate in, in what's going on in the world. I think it's part of our, our duty as humans to be consciously aware, not just of what's going on internally, but, but externally as well. I think it just is, you know, it comes back to where you're coming from. You know, a lot of people choose to see things with um, like a narrow lens and to see or pull, you know, kind of cherry pick maybe what they want to see or identify with. And I think the practice of yoga and meditation, you know, it it opens that lens up. It gives you a, a broader way of relating with people close to you and people far. You know, you don't have to be some kind of world leader or some sort of, you know, spiritual healer in order to empathically understand what people in Syria are going through Mm -hmm. at a time like this, that, you know, there's a way to, to kind of listen to what's going on in the world with, with your whole being in a way that allows you to be more compassionate in day-to-day doings. Mm -hmm. I think the role of, uh, um, of like the, the yoga person who wants to share yoga with the world in terms of dealing with people with different opinions or relating. I mean, you have to, you know, we're not living in a cave and we're not all monks or nuns where it's completely, you know, off the, off the grid. You have to relate to different people with different views, with different aims. I think what is lost is this, this concept of, it comes from, um, we got just universal wisdom, but it actually is one of the seven habits of highly effective people. I don't know if you've ever heard that book by Stephen Covey. Yeah. I think it's habit number five. The highly effective people are great leaders. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. And I think um, what the role of yoga can help you do and meditation really helps you do is seek first to understand, create a safe place. Drew mentioned empathy and listening with your whole being. Like when you're in a, a situation of discourse, you can learn to like put your opinions and views, you know, you can still hold them, you can still have your truth, but you can hold them for a little while to establish a, an underground of, okay, let's let's create the field of understanding first and then let's debate, let's look at the different points and let's share our truths. So often what you see, and it's it's like on, on television, it's like there's it's there's no first seeking of a, a common ground of of what what both parties are looking for. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants the same thing. There's there's so little common ground finding first. It's just, it's just so much jumping to conflict. And I think what the role of of yoga and meditation or this way of looking at things can can add to political discourse or dealing with all the very complex and difficult problems of the world is creating the kind of nervous system, creating the kind of mind and being that um, can set a template of understanding first before debate, understanding first before an exchange of truths. And if we come from a place that we all want the same thing, because all human beings do, even the people doing the worst possible things, all want to be happy, all want to feel safe, all want to feel loved. Those are our core human motivations. If we can come to this place of, of human understanding first and then debate, you know, there's going to be some friction. There's going to be some edges. Not everybody's always going to get along, but it just tends to take things down a notch so that, that in our lives we can move full, tend to move forward with harmony or part ways with harmony um, as best we can. Another thing that the yoga community can provide is is the a value of generosity. One of the, the real kind of guiding ethos, and I, I feel proud of the yoga community as a whole in this regard, um, but one thing that we we really do strive to do here at Heart Yoga in particular is, you know, from time to time we do benefit classes that are, are open to the public and people can just leave a donation. You know, we offer free meditation classes. I think one of the core ethics of the yoga path is generosity, is sharing, is giving. And that, I, 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 as, as um, if yoga has a role in the community at large in helping to be a voice for this or that value or this or that 
um, thing to help make the world a better place. I think generosity is something that, that yoga can stand for. And I think that's something that, that is, is a consistent theme throughout pretty much anybody. The, the yoga community on the whole, I think, is, is just oriented towards that feeling of, of giving. I guess I wanted to head towards more the purpose of others and kind of our duty as humans. What do you see as, I guess, the purpose of our existence on Earth or our duty as like a social species to our our home that is Earth? What is, what is our duty as a human? Big one, one Tanner. Pretty big one. Yeah. <laughs> we can delete it if it's too big. Um, wow. Well, you know, I think our duty as humans probably stems a little bit from our, our circumstances. I think, you know, in this country where, you know, that answer would probably be or should be different than, than maybe some of those elsewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think we're all kind of tied to this, like, I think maybe here where there's more opportunity and more privilege, perhaps. Um, I think it's, comes back to that generosity and coming from a place of giving and being willing to help others. There was this really interesting study done, I think last year sometime, um, that basically said when you're really struggling most in your own personal life, that that's actually like a, a calling from the universe to help others, that you actually help yourself most by, by giving back to other people. Mm. I wish I could source that that study right off the top of my head. I'll have to look into it and let you know, but something about that really resonates with me that I feel like as humans that being open and vulnerable enough to, to help others in, in time of need is really important. Yeah. To piggyback, there was a study I saw, this is from a book by Adam Grant called Give and Take. I can't remember what Adam does. I believe he's a professor out East somewhere. And the whole book is about how the most giving people can be the most successful people. There's often an idea that giving people are end up becoming doormats. And he said there's actually two categories. That there's two ways to be a giving person. There's a way where you take care of yourself and you give. And those people tend to be the most successful. There's people who discard themselves and just keep giving. And they tend to be the doormats that people think of. And, and the, so it's a really fascinating book, just as a side. But he talks about a study in there... Um, where on if you average like two hours of volunteer work per week, the I can't remember the ratio of how much happiness you get is like it, it's a significant boost in happiness. And he talked about a study of a, a woman who was like a young teacher in an inner city school, and you know how those people work. It's like early in the morning to late at night, and she was so passionate trying to help these kids, and you know underpaid and overworked the 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 very common story for so many of our teachers, but she found, and she was getting so burned out, but she found when she actually, you wouldn't, you would think this would be counterintuitive because she's in like a serving profession, but she found an opportunity to volunteer in something that was kind of related to education, but a little out of the box. And those two hours a week, like freshened her. There was something about it that, that took her back to her everyday grind. And it gave her this freshness. So there's something in what Drew's saying that, that, um, it's like, it's not, I don't know if duty is the right term, but it's, it's like built into our physiology that a little bit of giving can go a long way in terms of, of help helping us. In terms of duty, what came into my mind, Tanner, is actually we have a profound duty to ourselves. Ultimately, we have a duty to uncover something within that enables us to transcend, uh, transcend normal, everyday tensions and negativities and um, hopelessness and cynicism, the shells and the hard things that we build up inside of us, we have a duty in ourselves to, to, to not let life bury our spirit. I think that's our number one duty, um, to find a way to reclaim the spark that, we're, that we all, for the most part, have felt at some point or the other. That's our number one duty is to not let life bury that. To not, to not forget our heart. And in so doing, the social structure changes. You know, we have a, you know, it said that our inner relationship, our, 
the different parts of ourselves, how they relate, is manifest in our extra, in all our external relationships. The microcosm reflects the macrocosm, and it's our duty to 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 transcend the walls and barriers within, so that then naturally our our duty to others gets manifest. And um, so I, I think our our number one duty, not in a selfish sense, like a sense that you have to like acquire and um, get all these external trappings that supposedly lead to success. It's, it's an inner yoga is an inside job. Our ultimate duty is doing the inside work where, where we, we keep our hearts, we keep our spirits intact as we pursue the material aims that are necessary for survival and our own maintenance and taking care of our family. There's no doubt about it. You have to pay a mortgage and you have to eat food and we have to have a relationship with, with the material world. But as you pursue those things, do we lose our heart? Do we lose our spirit? Do we lose the powers of our mind? It's our duty to, to not do that. It's our duty to, 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 to claim it, reclaim it, cultivate it. As my teacher says, we don't have to become shorter, wider, and meaner as we get older. <laughs> we can keep our spirit. <laughs> So speaking of getting older, what's on the horizon for both of you? I'll, I'll go. At, I mean, really the horizon on the short term, we've got another great teacher training about to begin and um, uh, continuing to create more and more opportunities for people to initially learn how to become yoga teachers or continue their training as yoga teachers. That's our uh, a huge thing here. And another big part of our horizon is ensuring that the that the fiscal model behind all this um, beautiful talk and these beautiful values is, is sustainable. This is one thing that there's a lot of people out there who are, are striving to find a, a place where their passion and purpose can be a part of their profession. But to do so, it does require a business acumen. It does require um, two feet solidly grounded in the real world. And just because you start a business or you create a place where your passion is so alive and you feel so vibrant does not mean that you'll be able to pay your mortgage with it. And so to any of your listeners, <laughs> the, the, being a small business owner is as hard as everybody says it is. It's, it is a journey. Being an entrepreneur, I mean, some people maybe have more resources coming in. I was a yoga teacher my whole life. You know, <laughs> so so I didn't have a huge amount of savings as we went into beginning heart yoga, and it's it's a real adventure. So a, a big part of what's on the horizon for heart yoga is ensuring it's financially sustainable. That's a big part, of it. and building the structure that surrounds the passion, because that's that's as much a part of it as having the passion, as having the vision, is having the ability to make it real and bring it onto earth. And that's why I'm really glad I have this wonderful <laughs> Kali here. You know, I'm Gemini and Cancer and all these water and air and all this stuff. And she's Virgo, so solid. I've got a Taurus for a wife. We've got these earth people and these like these de detail oriented people around. So so we're we're making sure that um, Heart Yoga has the stability underneath it to be a, a organization that lasts not just past the five year window, but uh, maybe the 50 year or 150 year window. It'd be really a great dream for me to know that as I'm breathing my last breath, there's, there's people um, carrying on the heart yoga um, tradition, however many years that is from now, like I'll be breathing out and seeing heart yoga exist. It'd be a really amazing legacy to pass on. So. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. Do you have anything to add, Joe? No, I think he summed it up pretty well. I think, um, you know, Jason and I do really feel passionately about the teacher training aspect of it. And so if we can, if we can plug out more and more fantastic yoga teachers, um, that can help to expand these teachings beyond the, the walls of the 880 square feet that we have been uh, thriving in this far. Um, if we can, if we can open ourselves up to a, a bigger population and um, and reach more and more people, that's obviously the dream. Um, and to support people, like Jason said, that are looking to make this a profession and kind of marry their passion with, with their vocation, we'd love to do it. So, 
Cool. Yes. Best of luck. I, I feel the love in this space. My heart feels very open. I feel extremely challenged in the classes here in a way that I'm not at other studios. Um, but I feel like a sense of community in my challenge. The classes are small. The teachers are right there with me. I've stayed after about every single class just naturally to speak with you guys. Um, and other people do too. And I love yeah, the intimacy, the challenge, the inward journey you go on. Um, but also the community you share in that process. And yeah, it's very cool what you guys have going here. Yeah, it's a neat place. It's really an honor to be a part of it and an honor to be part of this interview, Tanner. Thank yeah, you. thank you yeah, very thank much you so for much. talking with us. So what actionable step are you going to take next? Do you have a lingering question or something you want help working through? Do you need support in doing what it's going to take to live your purpose? People of Purpose is here for you. Subscribe to the podcast and soak in the stories and words of our wonderful guests. Do you have any friends that might enjoy this episode or the podcast? Bring them on board as a podcast subscriber. If you want to actually see the guests behind the voices, as well as the purposeful people and communities I'm a part of around the world, follow the podcasting journey on Instagram at People of Purpose Podcast. You can connect with our purpose-seeking community on Facebook at People of Purpose by liking and following our page. Know the minute each new episode is published, hear first about upcoming People of Purpose opportunities, and receive regular tidbits of inspiration and media I'm purposely perusing, pursuing, and pondering. It's simply a regular dose of goodness, intentionally filtered by me, to nourish your personal path of purpose. For the ultimate engagement, join our intentional group Purpose Seekers from the Facebook page. Join in longer form discussions, link up with accountability partners, and share in opportunities and challenges to better know and grow in your purpose. Send me a direct message on either Facebook or Instagram if you want to talk privately and receive personalized guidance on how to raise your sales and write your ship. Come forth with your biggest dreams and aspirations, and I will do my best to connect you with the necessary resources and mentors from my network to start your trek along your personal path of purpose. Cheers, and here's to becoming 